legislature has given the broad general name of foreign mining tax, but it is usually inflicted on no foreigners but Chinamen. This swindle has in some cases been repeated once or twice on the same victim in the course of the same month, but the public treasury was not additionally enriched by it, prob probably. Chinamen hold their dead in great reverence. They worship their departed ancestors, in fact. Hence, in China, a man's front yard, backyard, or any other part of his premises has made his family burying ground in order that he may visit the graves at any and all times. Therefore, that huge empire is one mighty cemetery. It is ridged and, and wrinkled from its center to its circumference with graves. And inasmuch as every foot of ground must be made to do its utmost in China, at least the swarming population suffer for food, the very graves are cultivated and yield a harvest, custom holding this to be no dishonor to the dead. Since the departed are held in such worshipful reverence, a Chinaman cannot bear that any indignity be offered the places where they sleep. Mr. Burlingame said that herein lay China's bitter opposition to railroads. A road could not be built anywhere in the empire without disturbing the graves of their ancestors or friends. A Chinaman hardly believes he could enjoy the hereafter except his body lay in his beloved China. Also, he desires to receive himself after death. That worship with which he has honored his dead that preceded him. Therefore, if he visits a foreign country, he makes arrangements to have his bones returned to China in case he dies. If he hires to go to a foreign country on a labor contract, there is always a stipulation that his body shall be taken back to China if he dies. If the government sells a gang of coolies to a foreigner for the usual five-year term, it is specified in the contract that their bodies shall, cost, shall be restored to China in case of death. On the Pacific coast, the Chinamen all belong to one or another of several great companies or organizations, and these companies keep track of their members, register their names, and ship their bodies home when they die. The Si Yuk Company is held to be the largest of these. The Ning Yang Company is next, and numbers 18,000 members on the coast. Its headquarters are at San Francisco, where it has a costly temple several great officers, one of whom keeps regal state in seclusion and cannot be approached by common humanity, and a numerous priesthood. In it, I was shown a register of its members with the dead and the date of their shipment to China duly marked. Every ship that sails from San Francisco carries away a heavy freight of Chinese corpses, or did at least until the legislature, with an ingenious refinement of Christian cruelty forbade the shipments as a neat underhanded way of deterring Chinese immigration. The bill was offered whether it passed or not. It is my impression that it passed. There was another bill, it became a law, compelling every incoming Chinaman to be vaccinated on the wharf and pay a duly appointed quack. No decent doctor would defile himself with such legalized robbery. Ten dollars for it. As few importers of Chinese would want to go to an expense like that, the lawmakers thought this would be another heavy blow to Chinese immigration. What the Chinese quarter of Virginia was like, or indeed what the Chinese quarter of any Pacific Coast town was and is like, may be gathered from this item which I printed in the Enterprise while reporting for that paper. Chinatown. Accompanied by a fellow reporter, we made a trip through our Chinese quarter the other night. The Chinese have built their portion of the city to suit themselves, and as they keep neither carriages nor wagons, their streets are not wide enough as a general thing to admit of the passage of vehicles. At ten o'clock at night, the Chinaman may be seen in all his glory. In every little cooped-up, dingy cavern of a hut, faint with the odor of burning josh lights and with nothing to see the gloom by save the sickly guttering tallow candle were two or three yellow long-tailed vagabonds coiled up on a sort of short truckle bed smoking opium 
motionless and with their lusterless eyes turned inward from excess of satisfaction. Or rather, the recent smoker looks thus immediately, immediately after having passed the pipe to his neighbor. For opium smoking is a comfortless operation and requires constant attention. A lamp sits on the bed the length of the long pipe, pipe stem from the smoker's mouth. He puts a pellet of opium on the end of a wire, sets it on fire, and plasters it into the pipe, much as a Christian would fill a hole with putty. Then he applies the bowl to the lamp and proceeds to smoke, and the stewing and frying of the drug and the gurgling of the juices in the stem would well nigh turn the stomach of a statue. John likes it, though it soothes him. He takes about two dozen whiffs and then rolls over to dream. Heaven only knows what, for we could not imagine by looking at the soggy creature. Possibly in his visions he travels far away from the gross world and his regular washing and feasts on succulent rats and bird's nests in paradise. Mr. Ah Singh keeps a general grocery and provision store at number 13 Wang Street. He lavished his hospitality upon our party in the friendliest way. He had various kinds of colored and colorless wines and brandies and unpro with unpronounceable names imported from China in little crockery jugs and which he offered to us in dainty little miniature wash basins of porcelain. He offered us a mess of bird's nests, also small neat sausages, of which we could have swallowed several yards if we had chosen to try. But we suspected that each link contained the corpse of a mouse, and therefore refrained. Mr. Singh had in his store a thousand articles of merchandise, curious to behold, impossible to imagine the uses of, and beyond our ability to describe. His ducks, however, and his eggs we could understand. The former was split open and flattened out like codfish, and came from China in that shape. And the, later, the latter were plastered over with some kind of paste, which kept them fresh and palatable through the long voyage. We found Mr. Hong Wo, number 37 Chow Chow Street, making up a lottery scheme. In fact, we found a dozen others occupied in the same way in various parts of the quarter. For about every third Chinaman runs a lottery, and the balance of the tribe buck at it. Tom, who speaks faultless English, and used to be chief and only cook to the territorial enterprise when the establishment kept Bachelor's Hall two years ago, said that sometime Chinamen buy ticket one dollar hat, catch em two, three hundred, sometime no catch em anything, lottery like one man fight em seventy, maybe he whip, maybe he get whip himself. Welly good. However, the percentage being 69 against him, the chances are, as a general thing, that he get weep himself. We could not see that these lotteries differed in any respect from our own, save that the figures being Chinese, no ignorant white man might ever hope to succeed in telling tether from which. The manager, the manner of drawing is similar to ours. Mr. C. Yup keeps a fancy store on Live Fox Street. He sold us fans of white feathers, gorgeously ornamented. Perfumery that smelled like Limburger cheese. <laughs> Chinese pens and watch charms made of a stone unscratchable with steel instruments, yet polished and tinted like the inner coat of a seashell, a peculiar species of the jade stone, to a Chinaman peculiarly precious. As tokens of his esteem, C. Yup presented the party with gaudy plumes made of gold tinsel and trimmed with peacock's feathers. We ate chow chow with chopsticks in the celestial restaurants. Our comrade chided the moon-eyed damsels in front of the houses for their want of feminine reserve. We received protecting josh lights from our hosts and dickered for a pagan god or two. Finally, we were impressed with the genius of a Chinese bookkeeper. 
He figured out his accounts on a machine like a gridiron, like a gridiron with buttons strung on its bars. The different rows represented units, tens, hundreds, and thousands. He figured them with incredible rapidity. In fact, he pushed them from place to place as fast as a musical professor's fingers travel over the keys of a piano. They are a kindly disposed, well-meaning race and are respected and well-treated by the upper classes all over the Pacific Coast. No Californian gentleman or lady ever abuses or oppresses a Chinaman under any circumstances, an explanation that seems to be much needed in the East. Only the scum of the population do it. They and their children, they and naturally and consistently the policemen and politicians, Likewise, for these are the dust-licking pimps and slaves of the scum.